Welcome to Vertical City. I'm your host, Lennon Richardson. During each episode, I interview one of the world's top experts in architecture, urban design, engineering, or ecology, so that we can better understand and develop solutions for sustainable living. Thank you for listening, and get ready to join us on another groundbreaking and uplifting episode. Dr. Dixon de Pommier is an Emirate Professor of Microbiology and Public Health at Columbia University and the author of The Vertical Farm, Feeding the World in the 21st Century. Dixon developed the concept of vertical farming along with the help of graduate students in a medical ecology class he taught over a 10-year period beginning in 1999. Since authoring The Vertical Farm, he has helped inspire the creation of dozens of vertical farms around the world. Dixon is also the co-host of three podcasts. This Week in Virology, This Week in Parasitism, and Urban Agriculture. Welcome to the podcast. Dixon, I'd like for you to just... Thank you. Thank you. I'd like for you, if you would, just to start by kind of briefly describing how you define a vertical farm and why it's important, why it's an important concept. Sure. Well, um, I think... Most everybody is familiar with what a greenhouse is, okay? So if you start with the concept of a greenhouse, then it's, it's an enclosed growing space. And uh, a vertical farm is simply a two-story greenhouse. But that having been said, uh, it's a simple idea with a complex uh, engineering problem in front of it. How do you turn a single-story greenhouse into a two-story vertical farm? or a 20-story vertical farm, for that matter. And the same engineering problems uh, face vertical farming as uh, face the rocket scientists when, back at the end of the Second World War, they inherited all those um, German scientists that knew how to build single-stage rockets, uh, but they weren't good enough to get us to the moon. So we had to imagine what it would be like to have a three-stage rocket, and then, of course, we threw a lot of money at that project, and we eventually ended up on the moon many times, in fact. So... I think we're at, this, we're at the transition zone right now between a first-stage rocket, a single-story greenhouse operation, which can operate at maximum efficiency uh, using all kinds of advanced technologies to grow food, like hydroponics and aeroponics, and we'll perhaps touch on that later. Um, but the engineering part of this has yet to catch up to the concept of vertical farming because... I think the um, the demand and the need, the perceived need for vertical farming hasn't been um, universally accepted around the world, but there are places like Japan where they're, they're building vertical farms as we speak because they take up a space, you can locate them in cities, you can put food next to where people live, um, and so they have a lot of advantages once you've overcome these uh, technical difficulties. Okay. And if I understand uh, your concept correctly, it's it's an enclosed environment. Is that correct? Or is it also, could it also be in open that's Absolutely area? right. No, that's right. So any design of a building that has open windows or you put the food on the outside of the building, it doesn't really resonate very well with food security and food safety because plant pathogens and insect pests can still uh, have access to the, to the plants. And that's what you're trying to prevent by growing these uh, plants indoors. You're, you're actually trying to increase the yield by uh, extending the growing season to 365 days. So if you live in a, a non-tropical zone, um, such as the one I live in uh, around New York City, uh, you know, it gets pretty cold in the winter and uh, the sunlight is, is less, of course. So you've got these problems that you have to overcome and, and moving the plants indoors solves those problems. I see. And so the major advantage of having a vertical farm that's composed uh, compared to a greenhouse is obviously that you can grow more food in the, the one plot of land. Are there any other significant advantages? Yeah. You know, there, there are multiplicities of advantages that um, come along with being able to do that. I mean, you save uh, scads of water. You move these buildings inside the city limits, which is not typical for greenhouse agriculture. At least right now it's not. You can situate green markets on the first floor. You can situate restaurants on the top floor, so you don't actually have to have just uh, food as the uh, the main goal for this uh, project. Uh, you can, as they have in Japan, 
actually situated food growing inside of an office building, uh, which is a nine-story building. It's uh, called Persona O2, and it's located in the heart of Tokyo. You can actually go to work in a suit and at lunchtime go downstairs and work your way back up to the cafeteria, picking your lunch as you go. And um, a half hour later, after you've given what you picked to the chef, you've got a nice hot lunch waiting for you. Uh, the uh, freshest ingredients you can possibly imagine. So those are the big advantages of um, making these um, vertical, these greenhouses into multi-use buildings. Uh, mixed use is, I guess, the way the architects put it, but uh, that's, that's the way I see it. At least. That's excellent. I think the uh, idea of having the farms within the city limits is is outstanding. It reduces transportation, which reduces pollution. You're going to have fresher, sure. higher quality food. Sounds excellent. So the story of how Vertical Farms, this concept was born, is really quite interesting. Would you mind just retelling it uh, for the listeners who may not be familiar? I love telling the story because um, every time I um, tell it, I add some more details that I finally remembered. (laughs) You know, once you've you've started to talk about it, uh, you can recall all of the um, moments at which uh, this, this idea first came about. So uh, I began teaching this course called Medical Ecology at the School of Public Health here at Columbia University in 1999. It uh, was a course which emphasized the role of the environment in uh, disease. So it might seem like a radical idea to some of your listeners, but if you damage the environment, uh, there's always a health risk, always. And it either results in a short-term health risk or a long-term health risk. And sometimes those are not perceived right away. For instance, when you deplete the ozone layer in the stratosphere, and that was a gradual process that occurred over about a 20 to 25-year period, uh, we were not aware of the fact that um, UVB radiation uh, had free rain to come right down onto the surface of the Earth. And at higher latitudes and altitudes, people were at risk for acquiring uh, skin cancers. And uh, if you lived in Denver, for instance, the rates of skin, can, skin cancer went sky high, no pun intended. So, you know, you start talking about things like this to a class of enthusiastic graduate students that think they have a role to play in disease prevention. And uh, <clears throat> pretty soon they get the idea that all of these uh, encroachments into the natural world result in health risks that are pretty global and are hard to uh, address in terms of just a single individual. So. So about halfway through that course, the students uh, approached me and asked me if I was willing to allow them to work on a project that had uh, an uplifting endpoint. And I, you know, I, I looked at them. There were only seven students in this elective course, so it was a pretty easy decision on my part. Uh, all I did was say, uh, "You have to do good science, no matter what you do. You have to do the science that uh, backs up your project." And so a week later, they came back to me and they said they would like to work on rooftop gardening in New York City to see how many people they could feed. So I said, you, you should probably limit your study to Manhattan. So they, they agreed. And so the first step was to find out how much rooftop space there actually was in Manhattan, not including the commercial districts, of course. So I directed them to the map room at the public library on 42nd Street in Bryant Park which is one of the world's great resources for lots of knowledge, and including the map room, which contains maps the size of uh, perhaps a dining room table that takes two people to turn each of the pages. And seven students <laughs> pulled over these maps to determine the amount of potential growing space that the rooftops of non-commercial buildings uh, offered them, and and in fact, they, they came up with a very good number, and I, I can't recall the exact number right now, but uh, they decided then the next step is to find out what kind of crops that they wanted to grow, and so for that, they consulted the NASA website, because NASA has been very interested in, you know, leaving this planet, basically, and leaving someplace else, and I don't blame them for wanting to do that, <laughs> considering all the crap that's going on here, but they have investigated a lot of different crops that could yield um, a lot of energy per bite, right? So if you imagine which crops might fit into that category, you certainly wouldn't pick a, a nice watery tomato, for instance. Um, you'd, you'd want something that, where the energy is uh, concentrated. And in fact, the most energetic crop that you can eat turns out to be rice. So they planted rice on the rooftops of Manhattan to see how many people they could feed. 
considering that each person requires about 1,200 calories per day, and there are 2.3 million people living in Manhattan. And at the end of their two-week <laughs> machination over this part of the problem, this was the last day of class, they told me, uh, much to their chagrin, that they could only feed about 2.5% of Manhattan using all of the available rooftop space and growing rice. So... They were very disappointed. Yeah, they, that's that's exactly what I said. So inside, his their faces, they were actually very depressed over it. And I tried to mollify them with some compromise situation. And I, I turned to them and I said, you know, this is a very well thought out idea. You did the right thing. You did the science. You did the right calculations and everything. And you, you stuck to your conclusions which said that this is not a practical way of feeding Manhattan. But you could take your, your, your idea to the next level if you just moved it from the roof inside the building. You know, let's say it's a six-story walk-up. You've got the roof, and then you've got six more floors. And, of course, there are lots of abandoned apartment houses in New York City. Not too many in Manhattan, but a lot in the other four boroughs. They were amazed at that suggestion because they, they hadn't thought about that. So this would allow you to grow rice if you chose to do that year-round, all right? And I said, oh, you could instantly multiply your result times six if you could get your growing spaces inside this building. And that's where the idea started. You know, and that was the last day of class. So, you know, they left with smiles on their faces, and I left perplexed over the fact that I had just suggested something that I never had thought of before in my own life. Because basically, I'm a, I'm a research biologist that worked on parasites for most of my life. And this was something completely new to me. And so the more I thought about this, though, the more this thought of, where did that come from? Why did I say that? <laughs> it started to sink in, you know? And I said, yeah, that doesn't sound like such a bad idea, actually. Maybe we should take this idea up again next year and see where it goes. So over the summer, I kept driving my wife to work, which um, she worked in midtown Manhattan. And we started to pass buildings that we began to look at and say, I wonder what that building would be like if it was a vertical farm. You know, how transparent do they have to be? I wonder how you get the sunlight into those floors. Do you need sunlight? Maybe we can use artificial lighting. And, you know, the whole idea started to unfold in a very crude way, but I really thought it was still a crazy idea. But over the years that followed, and there were 10 of those years, by the way, and uh, you mentioned this book that I wrote, The Vertical Farm. You pick up a copy of the book, and there are a lot of them out there, used copies, by the way, as well as new. It's in paperback form now, so it's pretty cheap. If you turn to the back, the first appendix lists all 106 graduate students that worked on this project over a 10-year period. So I really don't feel comfortable taking credit, full credit at least, for the idea, because I really worked with a lot of very talented, very young and energetic and very intelligent people to flesh out the concepts, to challenge them first, to say, this is a crazy idea, let's say why. But the more we tried to say why, the more it appeared to be a pretty rational approach to urban agriculture. So in 2010, I published the book. And at that point, I didn't, uh, was not aware that there were vertical farms anywhere. It turns out that they were, but I was not aware of them because they didn't call them vertical farms. They called them plant factories, and they were located in uh, they were located in Japan. But the next three years, several vertical farms came online that called themselves a vertical farm. And so I can bring this concept up to date a little later on this podcast if you'd like to tell you how many are now in existence. And in fact, not only do I have to take my shoes off to count how many there are, there are so many that I need somebody else to help me count. <laughs> so that's been the miracle. The miracle of this idea is that it has actually come about. So what was the phrase you said they were called prior to vertical farms? The food factories? They were called plant factories. Plant, plant factories. Plant factories. Is, there any, is there any significant difference between a vertical farm and a plant factory? No, it's just how you spell it. <laughs> a plant factory, for, for the most part, plant factories are multi-story buildings. They don't necessarily have floors inside those buildings, but they're certainly a building that's taller than a single floor because you can fit more into them. And, you know, Japan is uh, challenged in terms of space. So for them, uh, vertical farming or plant factories make, make good, good sense. And so they've, they've actually, um, they have a national program now to make sure that, that vertical farming stays in Japan and that, that produces significant amounts of food. Great. So how many vertical farms are there, or plant factories, that you're aware of? 
Good question. <laughs> I think if I were to travel to Japan, I would find many, many more than I know about now. But I'm told by other people that have that traveled throughout Japan that there are now hundreds, hundreds of plant factories, and many of them do call themselves vertical farms. So there is one that uh, I'm very familiar with called New Veggie, N-U-V-E-G-E. And in fact, the reason why I mention it is the fact that uh, not only were they successful when they first started, but they now have several new branches to their uh, plant factories, uh, which they're calling vertical farms. So New Veggie is not only in Kyoto, but they're also located near the Fukushima event, uh, proving to the rest of Japan that, that you can grow food safely even in a distressed zone, uh, such as, as found in that meltdown. So they're confident that because you're controlling everything indoors and you don't let anything from the outside come in because you've sealed it off, uh, you, they use grow lights. They grow their food hydroponically. It's mostly leafy green vegetables. Uh, they've been quite successful in winning over the public to accept their food as safe and nutritious. Great. So in addition to Japan, where else can vertical farms be found? Um, well, if you continue through the through Asia, certainly China has some now. And in fact, I just received uh, an email from Green Fence Farms, which is in Portage, Indiana, that they have been hired by, and I'm now going to assume that this is a, a portion of the Chinese government that has hired them to replicate what they have in Portage in 20 different places throughout China. So uh, here's one particular uh, entity, Green Sense, which claims to be the largest indoor farm that currently exists. And they, are, they have been so successful that they have interested uh, China in becoming a partner in uh, spreading vertical farming throughout uh, the Chinese landscape, particularly in large overcrowded cities, that overcrowded now with farmers who had to leave the rural environment because their farms were failing. And so what you're experiencing in um, Asia right now is a massive urbanization, and that's really been a tragedy for uh, city managers and to find places for these people to to live and, and to find jobs for these people. And so vertical farming offers real opportunities at that level. Singapore is another place that you can find vertical farms. And in fact, in Singapore, uh, Panasonic, uh, that large electronics company that everybody's familiar with, is now in the vertical farming business, as is Toshiba. So Toshiba, on the mainland of, China, of Japan, has a vertical farm presence. And so does Panasonic, but Panasonic is, uh, they chose to locate at least their first vertical farm in Singapore. There's another one there already called Sky Greens. So there are two there, and there are many more in the planning stage. So I think you're going to see a hub for vertical farming in Singapore. And they're, they're really well positioned to export as well as to use those uh, production factories to manufacture food for themselves and for the surrounding communities. Then there are... As far as I know, there are no vertical farms in Europe as we speak or in the Middle East, but that's just because maybe I, I don't know about them. Maybe they're there and, and uh, I have yet to hear about them. Not everybody writes me and tells me what's going on, so I, I'm not the ultimate authority on this, but I know that there are some planned for Norway and Sweden and Denmark, and I'm going to make a trip to Denmark um, later uh, in November to attend a meeting on sustainable cities, and I think they won't be there because uh, they want to tell me uh, how they're going to use vertical farming to make cities more sustainable, and I think that's a real plus. The United States has lots of vertical farms. Okay, They're building one in Newark right now, which is about 70,000 square feet, called Aero Farms. They use aeroponics rather than hydroponics. There are many throughout the Midwest. The ones that I'm most familiar with are the plant, which is in the heart of Chicago in an abandoned uh, neat smoking plant that they converted to a four-story vertical farm. And there's one called Farm Here in Bedford Park, which is a very large warehouse. They also converted that to um, really LED hydroponic uh, farming. Uh, there are some in Indiana. In fact, there are two that I know about. There's uh, several in Michigan, and one of them, at least, um, Green Spirit Farms, uh, has now two franchises. One is in Detroit, and one is in Charleston, uh, West Virginia. So what I'm really trying to say is that of all the vertical farms that I've heard of, 
the ones that are, are still in existence are busy expanding their, their presence in the landscape, in the urban landscape. So that's a good sign because that means that not only do they understand how to grow food indoors, uh, they know how to make a profit. And I think those two things are absolutely essential for the survivability of the new industry. There's a vertical farm in Irvine, California, and they have plans for building three more. One is recently um, about to open in San Francisco. So if you know anything about that drought that's going on out there and all those fires, all of that impacts heavily on agriculture. And California, although they claim that they're still the breadbasket of America, I think they're going to have to retract that uh, that logo sometime soon because that drought isn't going away anytime soon. So vertical farming offers a real solution for supplying fresh produce for uh, the local people and also for export. So it sounds like a lot of these vertical farms that are in existence, were they new constructions? and Are, are also buildings being renovated or retrofitted? Uh, that's, that's a great question. So a lot of the early ones were in already existing buildings, uh, including the ones in Japan, by the way. And I forgot to mention one in uh, Jackson, Wyoming, all places called Vertical Harvest, and that's a brand-new building. That's going up from scratch. It'll be three stories tall, and um, it's not its not going to supply a lot of food. They estimate 40,000 pounds of food per month as a production line um, possibility. They'll be, of course, supplying fresh produce for the local restaurants and for some green markets and for some schools, but it's a demonstration project to show you what's possible. They're hiring the developmentally disadvantaged, which means if you have Down syndrome or <clears throat> you were born with a club foot and you can't walk or you have some kind of a uh, dysplasia which prevents you from ambulating correctly, so to speak, you can sit down and you can still do useful work. And in Wyoming, I'm told by the uh, developers of this uh, vertical farm that over 99% of the people that fall into the category of disadvantaged, uh, developmentally disadvantaged, are unemployed. So they're going to employ 100 people, which is the, the step in the right direction. And I think Wyoming has a real opportunity to make a statement as to what's possible uh, once you've uh, decided that you want to employ these people to do some useful tasks. And, and vertical farming falls into that category. That's great. So how large is the, the largest vertical farm that's currently in existence? Uh, it's, According to Green Fence Farms, they're the ones, and it's uh, well over 110,000 square feet of space, and it, they're totally enclosed. There are no windows. All the air is uh, filtered, and they use grow lights. They use LED grow lights from start to finish, and most of their produce is produced hydroponically. So right now, they are the largest, but there are others that <laughs> want to claim that for their, for their own um, benefit, and certainly, um, new veggie in, uh, in Japan thinks that the new factory that they're going to open that produces something like a million herbs of lettuce a year will classify at least among the top two or three largest indoor farms. So it depends on how you define it. You know, you could define it in terms of space or you could define it in terms of yield. Okay. Yeah. That's a good distinction. And so are most of them growing veggies or are any of them doing grains like rice? Well, they're all doing veggies. At this point, I don't know any that are doing more sustainable crops like rice or root vegetables or I know some of them are doing peppers and green beans and some legumes, but most of them are going for the cash crops that that pay the bills. And I can't blame them for doing that. I know for a fact that many of them are planning to diversify their crops to attract a larger uh, buy-in public and to make their green markets more viable. So in the near future, I think you're going to see potatoes and, you know, romaine lettuce and um, maybe celery and all kinds of other staples that you would ordinarily go to a green market and expect to be there, like garlic and onions and that sort of thing, uh, potatoes. But I don't see uh, any of them producing them now, probably because they're still brand new with this technology. I mean, this is... It's only five years old. I mean, you can't blame them for uh, for being hesitant in terms of getting involved with crops that might unnecessarily uh, give them a large profit margin. But I think in the near future, you're going to see it. So, are, are there any? Have there been any advances in the last five years that have made it more accessible or made this a more viable idea? Yeah, that's a great question, and uh, the answer is yes, of course. The one that I know of that's been the greatest facilitator of the um, 
let's get involved and make a vertical farm type of activity is the LED light industry. The LED light industry has come so far so fast because they they realize that their product is going to be essential for indoor farming. So Philips in Holland, actually I forgot to mention that Philips is in, in the process of creating a vertical farm on their research campus. So maybe that they'll be the first one in Europe, but uh, they want to demonstrate to the people that work there what their grow lights are used for. So what better way to do it than to make a, a vertical farm and when you sit down at the cafeteria, the food that you're eating came from that building over there. So that's a, that's a good advertisement for what's possible. In Lumatex, which is in uh, Austin, Texas, and has uh, actually made the guys that run that company uh, used to work for Phillips but they decided to go off on their own because they, they had insights and, into how to make the lighting better and more efficient and cheaper. And so that's actually what's been happening over the last five years. It's gone from a almost prohibitive cost to now a reasonable cost, and depending on what your energy costs are. And in most cases, people who install those lights do it because they know they can afford it. And, uh, you know, you're going to say, well, what is the profit margin for these companies, for instance? Uh, frankly, if they're not on the... The public stock exchange, you're never going to find that one out. But the best indicator that a company is doing well is the fact that they're expanding their business. And uh, as far as I know, there's only one vertical farming operation, and that's uh, Valcent up in Vancouver that decided to fold their tent and to, uh, to move somewhere else. Everybody else that I know of is in the process of making more of what they're doing. Yeah, it sounds like it's it's a new and emerging market. Yeah, that's exactly what I think it is. And so the other advances that have been made in the meantime have been in growing systems, the efficiency of growing systems for both hydroponic and aeroponic systems. And by that I mean it's become more modular, more easy to fit into unusual shaped spaces. Uh, it's become more efficient, uh, easier to assemble and reassemble, and as far as I know, there have been no major disasters in terms of contamination from the outside that would have potential impact on the uh, growing cycles indoors. Uh, everybody's been very careful to make sure that they practice good barrier. I would call it barrier medicine because they work at a hospital. But you, know, you can imagine what it's like to work in a hospital where you've got an, in, an intensive care unit. If you handle your plants the same way that doctors handle their patients in the intensive care ward. You've got a good picture of, of the future of vertical farming. So I'm familiar with hydroponics, but I'm not sure I, I totally understand aeroponics. Okay. Um, okay, so let's start with outdoor farming first. <laughs> outdoor farming, you put a seed in the ground, <clears throat> right? You throw some fertilizer at it, maybe some herbicides and pesticides, and then you water it. So you do that by irrigation mostly, although there are some technologies that don't require that, but for the most part, it's either a ditch between the rows of plants, or it's a hose with little tiny holes in it called drip irrigation, and the water then, you know, keeps the plants alive, basically, okay? So, <clears throat> hydroponics, on the other hand, <clears throat> uses a thin film of water, a piece of piping, which is made out of uh, polyvinyl chloride, and right away, everybody out there is going, oh, no, they're not using that to grow food in, are they? Uh, because there's some leaching of some materials that can occur if you're not careful about how you handle PVC piping. piping the piping that is used for hydroponic growing has been cross-linked with sulfuric acid, a mild treatment with sulfuric acid to keep these rogue molecules from escaping from the plastic constitutes PVC. So they've, they've thought about these things very carefully, and uh, they're taking every precaution to make sure that they don't uh, occur. At any rate, the, the thin film of nutrient-laden water actually runs across the root systems of plants. That's the, they call it NFT, or nutrient film technology. That's the most commonly used hydroponic uh, growing systems. Other so other uh, iterations of this are uh, shallow beds, waterproof shallow beds that are filled with nutrients, and you float the plants on styrofoam uh, with little holes cut out where the plants are put, and their root systems grow down into this water that's filled with their uh, food. And so that's another way of, uh, of managing hydroponics. Aeroponics takes the nutrient solutions and sprays them as a fine mist onto the roots. So it's like uh, perfume bottles with those little uh, 
rubber dispensers that you can squeeze, and out comes the mist of perfume. The mist, in this case, is uh, it's got the plant food in it. If you look at how much water is used by each of these three technologies, so it's a, uh, outdoor farming uses 70% of the world's available fresh water. That's unimaginable, but that's what we do, 70%. And once it's used, uh, because of all these other agrochemical products that we have to put in there to keep the herb, the, you know, the weeds out, and the plant pathogens away, and the insects at bay, uh, the water is unusable once it's used for irrigation. So when it passes by the root systems and, and washes out into, let's say, a river or a lake, it has adverse impacts on the environment as a result. Now, if you move indoors, hydroponic farming recycles all of its water, and it uses a total of 70% less water than outdoor farming. So it's highly, highly efficient. All right, but that's nothing compared to aeroponics. Aeroponics uses 95% less water than outdoor farming. That's remarkable. And that's a relatively new technology that was developed uh, by a guy by the name of Richard Stoner out near Denver in Colorado, and he was actually under contract with the uh, National Aeronautics and Space Administration to develop a very efficient way of using water to deliver nutrients to plants, and that's what he came up with. And, and we've been using it effectively ever since. The vertical farm that's opening in Newark uh, next March is called Aero Farms because they use aeroponics only to grow their food. Not bad. No, it's not bad. <laughs> That, yeah, that's excellent. All right. What do you think it'll take for this vertical farm movement to to really pick up even more momentum than it, than it currently has and to really be spread throughout the world? Yeah. So like any new technology, I think people have to know about it first to decide whether they want it. So the first thing that will help greatly is to have people like yourself getting the word out to other people that are totally unaware of this possibility and to have them just think about it for the first time. And I, I've encountered so many people in so many different places that said, I never heard of this before, but once I did, I couldn't stop thinking about it. And in fact, that's just the way I feel too, because as this idea arose in this class, uh, everybody just looked at each other and said, wow, I think we just stumbled on something that together uh, we can make happen. And so that was about year five or six after we, tried to defeat it and, you know, to say this is crazy and why should we be doing it? We, we have good reasons for wanting to do it, of course, but how do you do it? All right. So at that point, we had no clues except to replicate what was going on inside a high-tech greenhouse and to just make it into a multiple story building. But it takes a lot more technology than that in order for that to happen. And indeed, good engineering and good architecture connected with good growth systems has resulted in some really remarkable vertical farms. Uh, in order to get it more widely accepted, I think you have to have something happen, right? Like in Japan, for instance, uh, that big natural disaster created a vacuum in their agricultural system, and that vacuum rapidly filled with indoor farming in cities. And I wouldn't say that you need a disasters around the world, because if you visit Japan right now, you can see lots of examples of this. And, but you know that Japan is not one of the most widely visited places in the world. Um, what if we had a vertical farm in uh, New York City, for instance, you know, as a showcase? So that building over there, that's the uh, Freedom Tower. And you see this building over here right next to it? That's New York's first vertical farm. Well, we've, we're going to have one of those buildings in Newark. Now, Newark you know, it's not one of the most widely visited places either, except at the airport. A lot of people fly into Newark and fly out of Newark. And I'm convinced that the mayor of Newark is going to make the presence of this vertical farm widely known. And you'll see some evidence of that at the airport, too. Maybe you'll be able to eat at the restaurants at Newark Airport, all with food supplied by this one vertical farm that's now in existence. Many more to follow. Okay, so now if you go to Chicago and you talk to the mayor who just got reelected, you will find that Chicago wants to be the epicenter for urban agriculture. And they think vertical farming is the way to go. So if they feel that way, I'm certain that they will be that way. Because 
for instance, Barack Obama was, is from Illinois, in Chicago. Rahm Emanuel is uh, the successor for the Daly administration there. And I actually met with Mayor Daly, and uh, he was very excited about this possibility as well. So, so I think that what you're experiencing now is the lack of information and the lack of excitement that people are feeling, which will then translate into the next three or four years' worth of building. So I think we're, we're about to hear a lot more about it than you're hearing now. And I think if you typed out on Google the term vertical farming 2015, which I did today, the number of hits that that represents is in the 11 million level right now. In 2001, you type out, you know, from vertical farming 2001, you got four hits. And none of them related to the fact, to a real concept that we had come up with. So you can see how far that's come in just, that's a very short time, by the way. You know, the first telephone was back in what, Alexander Graham Bell's day, right? How long did it take to go from a telephone to a cell phone? Sure. I'm talking on a cell phone right now, and it sounds like I'm on a regular telephone. And how long did it take for the first airplanes to become commercial? And you know what it took? It took the First World War. Uh-huh. So that was, that, <laughs> you know, that was a little bit like the Fukushima event in Japan, which jump-started vertical farming. The First World War begged the development of aircraft. And, and so you, you need these events that push this along. And I think what we've got going for us right now is climate change. Climate change itself is really limiting at the moment, uh, and more in the future, but right now, if you go to the um, South Asia area, in India or in Southeast Asia, or even in China, they will all say that the landscape has changed over the last 20 years. The monsoons are not the same. We get much more rain much too soon. It washes away the soil. <clears throat> there's nothing left. It doesn't soak in. And there's nothing left at the end of the growing season, so therefore we have no water to irrigate with it. And so farming is failing. And that area of the world uh, is going to be uh, where vertical farming isn't essential. It's not just a nice idea. It's something that will save them. So, I mean, that's on the horizon, the near horizon right now. So I think your question is relevant, but I think the answer is just wait another two years if you can hold your breath that long. <laughs> I'm going to try to hold mine that long, too. Uh, and I think you'll be asking different questions in two years from now. Has this concept found its way into the educational system at all? Or are there any uh, college-level classes being taught around the vertical <laughs> farm concept? Great question again. Um, you've got lots of good thought, thought process going on here. The answer is that I just reviewed a PhD thesis at the University of Nottingham. The, the guy's name is Yuming Xiao. Yuming Xiao just wrote a PhD thesis on vertical farming. Great. I, I served as an advisor to Andrew Cranus at uh, Columbia's uh, School of Architecture in 2000. In the year 2000, he actually was, as far as I know, the first one to design a brand new vertical farm building. It never got built, but it was certainly an eye-catching design and it had lots of functionality to it. Uh, I sat with a student today from the University of Madrid in Spain who will be doing his thesis on vertical farming. So, And I get lots of email from students around the world wanting to know how they can get involved, or would I please read their report that they wrote for their school class project? And so I think the answer is yes. There's a lot of people thinking about it. I think we need uh, more books on the subject. We need more uh, metrics. By that I mean how much light for this plant, how much nutrients for this plant, how much temperature change, how much oxygen levels uh, in the water, how much electric electrical conductivity, that sort of thing. We need more science to make this a more robust subject so that people are not afraid to get involved because we, we can say, oh, we know how to do that. Uh, we're not quite there yet, I think. And uh, there are schools like the University of Arizona that teach controlled environment agriculture. Uh, UC Davis does as well. The University of uh, Michigan, uh, Penn State University has some, some courses in this as well. So I think uh, universities like the University of Nottingham, which has a desire to build an experimental vertical farm on their campus to allow students to play, so to speak, to do research on all the aspects of the, the questions that you're asking. I think that's really what's needed next, uh, in my view, and it wouldn't take long to get that established. Okay. So with all these different vertical farms that have been built around the world, have they been built just like 
by the companies themselves or have any of them been established by design competitions that bring multiple parties together to see who can come up with the best ideas? Uh, <laughs> you've preempted me on a subject that's near and dear to my heart. Uh, my first trip to Singapore was as a judge in an architectural competition among uh, ten different universities, three of them from the United States, one from England, one from um, Switzerland, one from Germany, one from Singapore, two from Japan, two from China. If that adds up to ten or not, but it should. The two teams from each school, and they were given as their task to create a uh, like a 50,000 person community, one square kilometer in footprint, 35 miles west of Hanoi in Vietnam, that could make all of the food for that city. So they all had vertical farm designs, all of them, and, and they were all different. It was a quite exciting. It was I was there for a week, and it was very exciting to listen to these groups present their projects and show their models and even, even make video cartoons of. <laughs> showing how it might work and that sort of thing. So, I, yeah, the answer is uh, there's a lot of activity at that level. There's the Association for Vertical Farming. There are two guys that run it, uh, Henry Gordon Smith and Max Losel, and they go around the world and they assemble three teams which have professional engineers, professional architects, and architecture and engineering students and they go out into the real world and they select sites and then they come back and design their projects. And well, many, many of those projects involve uh, food production. And of those, about 80% uh, address the issue of vertical farming. So there's been a lot of activity. And I think there'll be even more in, in the next uh, year or two because they've already asked me about it's available to go to various places, including Europe and South Asia and Southeast Asia. So I think... Uh, yeah, the answer is yes, there is that aspect too, and that will help to advance this um, growing industry. Okay. So we've been talking about uh, vertical farms now for a little over 40 minutes. Um, I'd like to broaden the conversation a bit, but before I do, I wanted to see if there's any other elements about the vertical farm movement that you really want to express before we move on to another topic. One of the issues that I've come up against that needs to be addressed is communities and particularly cities that have laws that prevent urban agriculture. And that sounds kind of ridiculous, but uh, if you think about the advent of modern times, so to speak, where the automobile was first invented, where trolley cars were first installed as means of modes of transportation, and bus systems were established in cities, they had to um, compete with cattle, with growing spaces for crops of various sorts that were helter-skelter scattered throughout the urban landscape. And so they enacted laws that prohibited those activities within certain limits of the city for the sake of safety, mostly. And today we find out that we we can get around those issues very nicely by modern technologies like our aeroponics and hydroponics. So, and forget about the cattle, they, they belong outdoors probably east of the west of the Mississippi. <laughs> but So that's been a, a, an eye-opener for me to see how uh, resistant some states and some cities in those states were to considering allowing urban agriculture back into the urban landscape. But even they have changed their tune because they can see some examples that work and that, that don't pollute. People want to know where their food comes from. They know what food miles associated with them. They want to see how the food is made. And, of course, this all affects the price of the food, too. So those, that's that's the only issue I, I would say that we didn't touch on yet, but uh, probably deserves mention. Okay, great. So uh, you're an ecologist, and I'm curious if you think that in the future it will be possible for us to truly develop a, a waste-free, zero-impact society. And if that is possible, or actually I guess my question is, do you think that's possible using our existing technology? And if not, is it foreseeable in the future? Right. Okay. So let's begin with the concept that uh, there are basically three different kinds of pollution. Okay. So you've got air pollution, which is caused by a multiplicity of uh, activities, mostly through the burning of fossil fuels, but not alone. There is industrialization as well. The effluent emanating from chemical factories and heavy manufacturing areas, steel. Uh, rubber, that sort of thing. So you've got that to deal with. 
So it has nothing to do with the municipal activities that, that uh, you and I are concerned about because uh, those are really uh, heavy industrial processes that need to be addressed at a different level. But let's just talk about the city itself. Could the city be designed using modern technologies that currently exist, which do not produce any harm to the surrounding environment? That's the question. And I would answer it a resounding yes. We we know how to do almost, well, no, no we, we know how to do everything, okay? We know how to capture energy passively so that we are not burning fossil fuels to get the electricity that we need to run our houses and our automobiles in the future, not too distant. If you own the Tesla, you're doing it right now. Uh, electricity is great because it's non-polluting, but it depends on how you make the electricity, right? The coal-burning power plants are a horrible source of electricity because of the amount of pollution that they put in the air, for instance. So we have to learn how to adjust our uh, energy production systems using photovoltaics, geothermal, wind, and if you're along the coastline, uh, you can use tidal power too. Those all exist, and they're highly efficient in some cases, and in other cases, the efficiency needs to be higher. <clears throat> but if you uh, go to uh, a country like Iceland, and then go to an extreme, and you go to Reykjavik, they get virtually every ounce of uh, power from geothermal which is non-polluting, but you wouldn't consider it non-polluting if it blew up and turned into a volcano, which it often does on, <laughs> well, that island. So, you know, they come with caveats, all right? And then there's a carbon footprint that you have to account for when you make a solar panel or when you build a wind farm. You know, that, that takes manufacturing, and uh, manufacturing under its current regime is a highly polluting industry for the most part. That is to say, there are very few low-pollutant heavy industries out there. Another great source of electricity is hydroelectric power. And if you move to France, 75% of their power comes from nuclear power plants. And you could argue that those are non-polluting. Other people would argue that they have the potential for great harmful pollution. But so far, they haven't had any meltdowns. And so they've been very fortunate. And I think they're carefully managed, obviously, not to do that. Municipal waste, uh, they come down to water, energy, and food uh, as the three main needs of the city, and transportation, and then you've got business versus recreational versus housing. You've got all those things to think about, and you've got to do it pollution-free, right? So is there any place on Earth that already does all of that? And I don't know of any place that does all of that. But I know all I know places that do one of those things, and they do it very well. There are some places that handle water extremely well, and they recycle water again and again and again so, so that they don't pollute the environment with discarded dirty water. They clean it up and they reuse because for them, water is very scarce. I know other places that capture passive energy. In fact, there's even one demonstration town. It's not a, a large uh, collection of people in Japan that uses hydrogen-powered fuel cells to generate all of its energy, and those are absolutely pollution-free. And, in fact, they, they all break the hydrogen apart from the water using uh, photovoltaics. From the sun, they create hydrogen, and then later on they put it back together with water, and when they do that, they generate energy at that time. So clever uses of the environment and their, their energy footprint to make sure that you don't have to use um, fossil fuels, for instance. Food manufacturing, of course, we've just talked about that a lot. So I think that uh, there are some cities that are considering vertical farming as their main source of, of food, and Seoul, Korea, is that city. Uh, in Korea, there's, I forgot to mention, there's a vertical farm there. Uh, it was established by the Rural Development Authority. It's in a little town called Suwon. I actually had the privilege of visiting it. And that little demonstration project convinced the uh, Korean South Korean government to expand that operation into the city of Seoul, and they, they now want hundreds of examples of vertical farms spread throughout the landscape of Seoul, and it's a huge city, by the way. It's got some 35 million people living in there inside the city limits, and it's an enormous space. So 150 farms is not going to do it for them. They'll probably need several thousand in order to accomplish their goal, but they want to start. So that's a place where food might be uh, off the grid in terms of energy 
And when I say energy, I mean that you're not plowing the field and harvesting with a gas-driven or a diesel-driven device, and you're not shipping it to the cities, and you're not having to store it by refrigeration. Uh, there are a whole bunch of things that don't happen when you make your food right next to where you eat it. Water, I, I'm very passionate about water because I think uh, water, if you don't have water, you don't have life. So if you look at all the reasons why we sent these probes to Mars, there was only one reason, and that was to know whether or not life ever existed on the planet, which no longer has any standing fresh water that's at least on the surface of the planet. Uh, you might consider the ice cap as, as standing water, but actually it's mostly carbon dioxide. If water had existed on Mars at some time, and we know it did now because of all the evidence that we've got indirect, uh, it's, it's possible that life did exist there. So, but life does exist on, <laughs> on our Earth, and it exists simply because there's a lot of water on the planet. But what happens to that water, and how do we abuse it? How we take it for granted is really very upsetting. For instance, New York City, which I'm very familiar with, uses about 1 billion gallons of fresh water every day. And they, they create gray water from that. And then what do they do with the gray water? Well, there are ways of handling gray water where you could actually get it back to the, the pristine the level that it was before it became gray water. And it's done by a, a variety of technologies. But instead, the Oracle likes to take this gray water and throw it into the hubs. So every day they, they ship a million gallons, a billion gallons, excuse me, a billion gallons of water from the Catskills to New York City through an elaborate series of tunnels and reservoir systems. They use it, and then they treat it, and then they discard it. And that's just, you know, 18th century thinking. I mean, that's just like considering that we have all the water in the world and we don't have to conserve it. Uh, I know other places that recycle water again and again and again. So if you were to cobble all of these technologies from places like Malmö, Sweden, and Curitiba, Brazil, and Copenhagen, uh, Denmark, and San Francisco, which recycles all of its waste oil, by the way, and uh, burns it to get the energy back, but because it's derived from plants to begin with, it's net zero carbon loss, because the carbon goes in the air, goes back to the plants, you make the oil flow, you burn it, you put it back, etc. So... If you put all those things in one place, you'd have an ecosystem. Okay. And I truly believe that right now, today, we could build from scratch a very efficient ecosystem that did not rely on outside uh, resources once the cycles were established within the city. That is to say, once the water was brought in from some source and treated to make it usable, we could continue to treat that same water and you reuse it and reuse it and reuse it. Uh, we could capture our energy from, as I mentioned before, uh, solar panels and wind and tidal and geothermal. And we could grow our food inside the city, too. Uh, not all of it, but we could grow a lot of it. So um, until we try to do that, uh, we'll never know the answer to your question. But I, I know we're, we're going to have to try it sometime if you want to establish a colony on the moon or if you want to go to Mars. Uh, it's pretty stupid to try to establish all of that once you get there without actually knowing how to do that. So <laughs> pretend you're on Mars, on Earth, and do it here, and then export the technology once you're sure of how it works. All right, excellent. Well, this has been um, a very excellent interview. I definitely appreciate your time. With just a couple of the last no. minutes we have here, uh, do you have any uh, call to actions you'd like to make or parting words for our listeners? Sure. I think if you find this concept exciting or if you want to know more about it, there are lots of resources out there, including used copies of my book. <laughs> you could uh, listen to our own podcast called Urban Agriculture. And on that podcast, which is available on iTunes, it's free to the public, you can hear me interviewing, just like you're interviewing me. I interviewed about eight different vertical farming operations and the owners, and I got them to explain how they do it. And uh, how they got started and what their story was. So it's, it's quite interesting to hear how different each one of these groups is when you start to look at what they're doing now. Uh, none of them knew about each other. They did it independently of any uh, knowledge that the others shared with anyone. Uh, they just read up on it and uh, consulted a few growing experts and uh, took over an old Walmart that was, dis that was abandoned, established some grow lights and some racks of uh, 
of hydroponics inside and started to sell produce. And, and that's the way Farm Beer actually started. <laughs> so I think there's a lot of ways of getting involved. But remember what I said in the beginning of this um, interview, and that is that the biggest missing element right now are qualified growers. So if you really want to get involved in, in the industry, uh, my best advice to anybody out there would be to get educated in how you grow food indoors. And most uh, large ag schools have uh, courses on hydroponics and indoor farming because they support the greenhouse industries that are already up and rolling. And the largest of which, by the way, is out in Arizona called Euro Fresh Farms. It's 318 acres of greenhouses in the middle of the desert. How do they do that? It's interesting. You can visit their website and you can see how they do it. And they produce really tasty, delicious tomatoes. <laughs> and you say, hydroponic tomatoes, they taste horrible. They actually don't. If you know how to produce them correctly, they'll knock your socks off with taste. But uh, you got to know what you're doing. So how do you find out? what to do. And the answer is you go to a good ag school that's got a reputation for training greenhouse managers like the University of Arizona. So that's my best advice. Okay. Thank you so much, Dixon. I definitely appreciate it. Well, it was my pleasure. Thank you for listening to this episode of Vertical City. Learn more about the Vertical City concept and continue the conversation by visiting our website, verticalcity.org. I truly hope that you've enjoyed this episode. If you did, please subscribe to our podcast, leave a review on iTunes, and most importantly, share Vertical City with your friends and colleagues so that together we can create solutions for sustainable living. I'm Lennon Richardson, signing off for the Vertical City team. See you next time.